we're dealing with a public safety issue here. There is no question that immunizations uh, have been effective in eliminating things like smallpox, which were devastating and lethal diseases. So you have to be able to separate out uh, our rights versus the rights of the society in which we live, because we're all in this thing together. Dr. Ben Carson on this program earlier this week saying vaccines are really necessary in terms of public health and the public's right to health outweighs parental choice. This vaccine debate has been thrust into the national spotlight in the wake of over 100 confirmed cases of measles now in our nation. But the question remains, where is the line between public health and parental rights? It's a matter of health, thus health matters. And we'll have a discussion. First of all, we want to welcome in Barbara Lowe Fisher. She's the president of the National Vaccine Information Center. Uh, center screen for us, Nick Tate, Dip, uh, Newsmax deputy health editor. He is the author of the book, Da Vinci's Baby Boomer Survival Guide. And my fellow baby boomer, Ellis Hennigan. At least we have something in common chronologically, if not philosophically, Ellis. Uh, Ellis, a radio and TV commentator who leans leftward. Barbara, let me talk to you about your personal experience. Where do we draw the line on parental control over vaccination of children? Well, I think we have to put it out on the table right now that vaccines are the only pharmaceutical products that government recommends and mandates and completely indemnifies. In 1986, Congress passed the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act gave partial liability protection to vaccine companies uh, who were threatening to go out of the business, leave this country with no childhood vaccines if they weren't given protection from vaccine injury lawsuits. The pediatricians also got liability protection. In 2011, the U.S. Supreme Court said vaccines are, quote, unavoidably unsafe, and therefore there shall be no product liability lawsuits against manufacturers even if we could provide evidence that the vaccine could be made safer. This means that the ethical principle of informed consent to medical risk taking must apply to vaccines. We cannot be living in a country where government dictates that we use a pharmaceutical product that can cause harm and we cannot hold anybody accountable who, who makes some profits from the vaccine, who regulates the vaccine, who votes to mandate the vaccine and gives mm -hmm. the vaccine. Uh, accountable in a civil court of law in front of a jury of our peers. Now, Nick Tate, Barbara says we have no recourse if there's a problem here, but, but don't the health experts say that there is no doubt that it is absolutely clear these things do save people's lives? That's absolutely true. I think Barbara's raising a really good point on whether or not uh, doctors and uh, the manufacturers of vaccines should be uh, exempted from any kind of action. But the, the debate in science really does not exist. Uh, virtually all mainstream medical groups, CDC, World Health Organization, uh, pediatricians, American Medical Association, all say vaccines are safe, effective, and necessary. And what I worry, and what I would ask Barbara is, does she, is she concerned that, in fact, the debate over exemptions for vaccine manufacturers is confusing the issue for parents when it comes to should they vaccinate their children or not? I don't believe that the center is against vaccination, but I'm wondering how parents should be interpreting the information in this larger debate on public policy. Our organization has been here since 1982. We have, our mission is to prevent vaccine injuries and deaths through public education and to defend the informed consent ethic when it comes to medical risk taking, including vaccine risk taking. And the science is not clear. There is a lot of debate in the medical literature, not only about vaccine risks, but about the long-term uh, durability, the effectiveness of these vaccines over time. There's a lot of talk about waning immunity. Certainly pertussis vaccine is an excellent example. The government has already acknowledged that you can be fully vaccinated with pertussis containing vaccines. You can be infected, show few or no symptoms. You can transmit that infection, whooping cough, to other people who are vaccinated and unvaccinated. There is, a, there is also a discussion about measles vaccine and its long-term uh, effectiveness. There have been calls in the medical literature for a new MMR shot or a measles uh, shot because it, there is waning immunity. So the science is not settled. Science is evolving. 
we have to be open-minded here and we have to talk about doing the good science that will answer the outstanding questions that parents have had for three decades about the safety of the of vaccines certainly but now about the effectiveness the long-term effectiveness of these vaccines and that is a question that remains in fact it's something i'd like you to ponder during the break because when we come back we are going to talk about the politics surrounding public health and public policy on this issue of immunizations. Barbara, Nick, Ellis, and yours truly, we're all coming back. Hope you will too as America's Forum continues. What's your opinion on vaccinations? Parents ought to make sure their children's, children are vaccinated. Leaving no doubt about where he stands on the question, but heading into a presidential campaign, will vaccinations and immunization be a hot button issue for the rest of this race? Let's continue our conversation and welcome back in Barbara Lowe Fisher, the president of the National Vaccine Information Center, uh, News, uh, Newsmax Deputy Health Editor Nick Tate, and our co-host for this hour, Ellis Hennigan. Ellis, let me turn this political to you now. What do you think shapes up in the presidential campaign for both Republicans and Democrats on this issue? Well, J.D., not such an issue on the Democratic side. Hillary Clinton laid down a marker two days ago saying she's entirely in favor of vaccines, and there's no one on the Democratic side that's going to challenge that. It could be a big issue, though, on the Republican side, where the candidates really are split and already stumbling over the issue. You saw Chris Christie uh, in London uh, having some issues with it. Uh, Rand Paul, not quite sure where he is. Uh, Jeb Bush weighing in. So, yeah, you're going to see a lot of fight on the Republican side about that very issue. I want to turn to Barbara for a second, though. Uh, Barbara, you know that as you raise doubts about the science and seek to undermine public confidence in that, there will be parents who will not have their children vaccinated. Do you worry that we're going to get a, a big epidemic of measles or other serious diseases that were, that were all but eradicated in this country? Won't you feel bad if that happens? I think we have a duty and responsibility uh, to question one-size-fits-all vaccine policies that don't respect biodiversity, that do not that treat that try to treat everyone as the same when we have genetic and biological and environmental differences that can make some people more susceptible to vaccine reactions and injuries than other people i think that this conversation has become very ugly and divisive i don't think it's useful i think we need to talk about substantive policy issues like we're doing on this program uh, and so I, I, I worry about the fact that we have had calls in the last week for imprisonment of parents who do not give their children every government recommended vaccine, lawsuits against parents. Uh, it, it's, it's become, it, people are being demonized, they're being marginalized. I mean, are we going to be a country where we cannot ask questions about public health policy without being uh, punished? Uh, I want to read the numbers of vaccines that are in the research pipeline, that many of which will be mandated, and we, we need to have the right to make choices. Hepatitis C and E, syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes, HIV, cytomegalovirus, enterovirus, E. coli, adenovirus, obesity, high blood pressure, acne, tooth decay. If there is an ailment out there, you name it, there is a vaccine being developed for it. We have to be very careful about taking away protections in our vaccine laws in the form of non-medical exemptions so that we have absolutely no choice about the use of liability-free pharmaceutical products that government recommends. I think it's the responsibility of all of us to ask these questions. Two minutes and 30 seconds remain. Nick Tate to you. If I could paraphrase what we heard from Barbara right there, at least at the outset, she says, look, uh, one size doesn't fit all that there may be some some exceptions, some situations that medical science has to deal with. One size does not fit all is a governmental philosophy uh, quite often expressed by those who say states should maintain rights and not yield them to the federal government. With the two minutes that remain, Nick, do you believe the states will keep control of this or will this suddenly become a federal issue? 
Well, the history has shown that the states do have control, and that's why there are wide variations in what states allow in terms of parental choice on vaccines. To Barbara's point, though, I think she's raising a, a good issue, and, and the one-size-fits-all does, in this case, really it should be a one-size-fits-most. That's what the scientists and the doctors say. The vast majority of kids who get vaccines are, in fact, it doesn't confer lifelong uh, immunity. There are some eff efficiency questions. Can we make vaccines better? Can we make them safer? Absolutely. Should that research continue? Absolutely. But what doctor will say, what doctors will say, is that we need to do the best that we can for those vaccines, for those diseases that are communicable. Many of the things that Barbara lists are indeed only things that will affect you individually. They won't affect other people. So. When parents decide not to vaccinate their children against preventable diseases, they are often making the choice not only for their children, but for other children in the community. That's the larger, more difficult issue, but I commend Barbara for trying to raise the, the level of debate so we're not demonizing parents on either side. You know, look, parents on either side of this issue are concerned about the safety of their children. That needs to be priority one, the health and priority of their children. My advice on this issue is if you're a parent struggling to make sense of this, for goodness sake, talk to your doctor. Get as much information as you can and put that information in perspective for yourself. There may, in fact, be a very, very, very small number, percentage of children who may have a problem with vaccine reactions. We need to identify how we can find out who they are and make sure that they're safe. But in the meantime, if you're trying to decide what to do for your kids, talk to your doctor, get as much information as you can. And as we say on this program, that's where your health debate should start. And uh, that's where we'll have to end it right now. Hey, if you need to find out more about being a baby boomer, and I know I do, check out Nick's newly released book, Da Vinci's Baby Boomer Survival Guide. You can find out more at babyboomers711.com.